Welcome, everyone. This is uh, another installment of the Evolution and Social Science uh, Speaker Series. I am thrilled to introduce Tom Scott Phillips for today's lecture. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to give you a preview. We have two more lectures this semester. Uh, next month, uh, Kevin Flaherty, who's recently joined the Anatomy Group, will be talking about cognitive and, and, and neurological evolution from an anthropological uh, perspective. And then at the end of the semester in December, Johannes Schul and um, Sarah Bush will be talking about teaching evolution and some of the challenges that poses. Uh, we also have a, a great slate of speakers next semester, so stay tuned for that. Uh, today we have Tom Scott Phillips, who recently joined the Basque Foundation for Science, where he is a research associate. Uh, his background is sort of at the intersection of evolution and cognitive science. I believe, if I remember correctly, you did your PhD at um, Edinburgh. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and his work focuses, he's published a lot of papers and a lot of different topics, but the, 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 the biggest focus is language and communication, especially as it pertains to evolution. Uh, today's lecture is on a topic uh, going back to Darwin on the diversity of human expression, uh, I suppose. Um, and one other comment before I give the uh, floor to Tom is, since this is a Zoom format to foster engagement, Tom said it would be okay if you wanted to ask a question during the presentation. Of course, we'll have the Q&A after. So if you have a question, use your raise hand feature and if it's something that needs to be addressed during the talk, and I will interrupt Tom. If not, save your questions for the end. So with that, I will give the floor to Tom. Thank you very much, and thank you for the rather generous introduction. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do service to the highest of Darwin, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, let me share my share my screen. Okay, so then I can press play over here. I'm not sure. Be good. Yeah. Okay, great. So yes, unity and diversity in human communication. Uh, I'm going to essentially have give you the to give you the takeaway straight away i'm going to argue that although there is enormous diversity in the different means by which humans express themselves there is underneath that some cognitive unity now i won't spend um i won't really elaborate on in detail about the sort of the evolution of uh well the evolution well, here's what i want to say the evolutionary aspect is in the background so if there is cognitive unity underneath the behavioral diversity then the evolution of many different diverse means of communication that extend from language use to teaching to, well, many others, um, uh, derive from, from a common source. And I think that common source has evolved from means of social cognition and in particular attention manipulation that we share with, uh, we, we share the social cognition with other primates. Uh, and then we've got particular forms of attention manipulation, which I'm gonna talk about today, which are quite distinctive to our species and which allow an enormous array of diversity um, that uh, you know you see all around you uh, as a human. So just to elaborate on that diversity, there is most obviously language use, but there's, in, uh, as I say, much else besides. So sometimes we wink or we nod, um, we shrug our shoulders, we point our palm, palms up to the you know up, up to the ceiling, perhaps open, open our hands, or we point our we, we move, use our hands to indicate down to the floor. Or we point up to the ceiling, and sometimes we draw pictures about people doing this, and we put those pictures, uh, you know, on the wall or up for display in some other way. There are micro movements that aid the coordination of dance partners. Um, there are exaggerated displays of enthusiasm or affection. There are also fashion choices, um, you know, which, which indicate something of our, you know, um, disposition or attitude to the social world around us. There's graphs and figures. Um, and then there are quasi-linguistic cases like interjections and idiophones, so brr or ow, um, which have some features of linguistic phenomena, but not all of them. So there is this enormous diversity in human expression. Uh, and as I say, I'm going to argue that there's a, a very large amount of cognitive unity underpinning that. So the structure, um, I'm going to talk about some non-canonical to sort of motivate some of the important distinctions. Talk, some, talk about some non-canonical means of uh, human expression and then provide something um, of a framework, I hope, to make some sense of uh, these non-canonical means and the diversity that I've just attempted to summarise by describing in particular two continua, one in ways of informing one another and one in ways of being informed by others. 
And I'll give you an example, a specific example um, of teaching, a short video, just a minute long, but it contains a lot of diversity in quite an ordinary uh, case of human interaction. And then uh, having laid that groundwork, I'll talk a bit about my work on art and art institutions and how um, art institutions exploit the cognitive capacities that underpin you know, ordinary communication and all this other diversity that I'm gonna talk about. So just to go back to that evolutionary point again, you know, to put it in very bold terms, I'm suggesting that, you know, not just art or teaching, language, all of these derive from a common cognitive unity. And, you know, if you can understand the evolutionary foundations of that cognitive unity, you have the evolutionary foundations of a great deal of what is most distinctive about our species. Okay, so that's the structure. Let's start with a simple hypothetical example before a concrete one in a moment. So imagine you're at a polite dinner party and you'd like some more wine, but you think it might be, a, maybe you've drunk your first wine glass too fast and you think it might be a bit rude to ask right now for another white wine glass. So you wait until your host's back is turned and you move your empty wine glass to the middle of the table and you just wait. And then the, the host turns around and sees that you have an empty wine, uh, empty wine glass. And um, because they're a good host, they now fill your wine glass. They did not know that you 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 you, you have informed them that your wine glass is empty, and you know uh, you, you've informed them that the wine glass is empty. You didn't announce that you were informing them, and they don't know that you informed them of that, but you did inform them. Um, so we, and we call this hidden authorship. So you're, you're in hidden hidden authorship. You inform someone, uh, but you don't announce that you're informing them. Uh, and, and and you know if it goes well, then you you know they are informed in the way you want. Here's a Real world examples, not strictly hidden authorship, but certainly non-canonical. This is um, this was spotted by the daughter of my co-author Christoph Heinz. This is a window somewhere in France, and people it's on the ground floor, so there's these uh, um, metal um, grill has been placed in front of the window to uh, avoid van you know, vandalism, and people have started placing inside the metal grill various bits of litter and rubbish and so on. Okay, so so far just the window with some litter. But somebody has decided to be a bit clever and creative and they've put in, they've, add, they've pasted this on the wall. And this is um, just like, a, you know, like the little things you have in museums that tell you who the artist is. And if you zoom in and you translate to English, it says, our remains 2021, anonymous co-creation, cups, plastic bottles, cans, various packaging. Okay, so it's presenting this window as if it was an artifact in a museum. And this is interesting and clever because it asks quite, you know, funny questions, humorous questions about, well, who is the author? What could they possibly mean? Uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And, you know, you could debate that at some length. And, you know, the fact that those questions don't really have good answers is, is part of the point in many ways. Okay, so let's make some sense of this. So in ordinary communication, there is both an informative aspect, which is, you know, what you want to do to an audience's mind. And there's the communicative aspect, which is that you announce, you show to the audience that you want to do something to their mind. Those of you that know um, some philosophy of language may recognize this idea of um, deriving meaning from intentions and embedded intentions from the work of Paul Grice, very influential work from Paul Grice. So in ordinary communication, both the informative and the communicative aspects are present. In deception too, there is also informative and communicative aspects, just that in deception, the informative aspect is what is deceptive. So you're telling somebody falsehood or whatever else it might be. In hidden authorship, again, there is an informative intention. You, know, you want to do something to somebody's mind, but you don't announce that that's what you're doing, and hence the communicative aspect is not present. In fact, it's hidden, it's actively hidden. There are cases where, although the communicative intention is not hidden, it is nevertheless not so present. So here I think a good example would be, um, I'm at a supermarket and the cashier is scanning my goods and I leave my credit card on that little you know, platform that they sometimes have. Now. I'm not necessarily, you know, I may, I may want the cashier to understand that I'm going to pay with my credit card, but I'm not you know, particularly announcing that fact. I'm not holding it up in an overt way, nor am I hiding it. It's there, but the, the authorship is unannounced. It's, it's relatively absent. The litter in the window, well, in and of itself, it's just litter in the window. There's nothing to say, really. There's no informative aspect. There's, there's nothing expressive or communicative going on. The funny thing about putting, just putting that little uh, placard or plaque, excuse me, next to the window, is that it asks funny questions. So 
the person who puts it there seems to have some sort of communicative intention. You know, it's worth paying attention to what the people who put this here were doing, but they weren't doing anything. And that's why it's quite funny and interesting, right? I've put question marks there because as I said, I don't really think there's a, a, a you know, there's, there's a good answer to those questions, but it's interesting to think about. Okay. Let me just elaborate these distinctions a bit more for you um, with a summary of an experimental study many years ago now. I spent a few months in Mike Tomasello's lab and we did a experimental study on hidden authorship with children. We did three-year-olds and five-year-olds. I won't go into all the details but sent of, of the study, but essentially we set up a situation where an adult is looking for, the, um, for some missing uh, puzzle pieces and the child knows where these puzzle pieces are. Um, but in two different conditions, the child is either motivated to hide their, in, their informative intention because they know the adult doesn't want any help, or they're not, they don't have any such motivation. The children want to help. The young children always want to help people solving puzzles. But you motivate them neither to hide that or not to hide that. And what's interesting is that even the three-year-olds, we weren't sure, Mike Tomasello wasn't sure if the three-year-olds would, would do this, but uh, they do. So we find that... Um, when they have a motivation to, when the adult doesn't want any help, that's the green bar here, then the children make active attempts to suppress their communicative intentions quite often. That doesn't mean they're good at it. So sometimes they're, you know, they sort of do things like this. If you can just see on the camera, they go, and they sort of point without pointing at the thing. You know, they grab your attention, point without pointing as if, oh, I wasn't really trying to communicate with you. So it's not that they're competent with it, but they do attempt to do it, which shows that they have some understanding of these different aspects of what's going on in communication, these different layers. So as I say, they're able and willing to differentiate informative and communicative intentions on the production side. Now, I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. First, I think it's part of the you know, enormous body of evidence from many labs that children, um, you know, the competence in communication is early emerging, and I would, the phrase I like to use is part of the ordinarily developing human cognitive phenotype, where communicative species, you know, other people would use simple words like innate or core cognition, biological endowment, whichever term you prefer, think that communication is part of that. Um, and it also motivates these important distinctions uh, between the informative and the communicative aspect. So now I'm going to push that point a bit further in order to um, in order to motivate those continua I mentioned earlier and um, then make some sense of the behavioral diversity. Okay, so continua in informing, which is say on the production side of things. So we have ordinary communicating and we have, we've already talked about two examples, absent authorship and hidden authorship. It seems to me that there are very plausibly, and I'll give an example shortly, cases which are actually in between there where still informative intention, but the communicative aspect is partially there. You make it somewhat manifest that you have an informative intention, maybe not fully overtly so, as in you know, language use or overt points or so on, but nor are you, you know, particularly putting it to the side. Not only can there be these partial cases, but the, the distinction between the absent case and the, the ordinary communication case is not a categorical distinction, but it's a continuum. So there's and to be quite precise about it. There can be graded variation in the extent to which actors make their informative intentions manifest. They can make them wholly manifest, they can make them not manifest at all, and lots of points in between those. And then we can turn to the other side, the being informed side, the audience side. To what extent does having recognized somebody's informative intention actually contribute to your interpretation now, those of you that do know Grice will recognize that, uh, will remember, I should say, that Grice's key insight is that recognizing that somebody has an intention towards your mind uh, is what is crucial in determining what they mean. Uh, that's essentially is the, the key insight in Grice. Uh, and that's, so that's certainly the case in ordinary communication. In, in hidden authorship, the whole point is that they don't, the audience does not recognize that you have an informative intention, so it can't contribute to their interpretation of your behavior. In absent authorship, maybe, maybe not, depends what your audience cares about. But there, again, there can be cases uh, in between which, are, you know, maybe I recognize your informative intention and it helps me understand the world a little bit, what you're doing a little bit more, but not it, it doesn't um, shape it to, to, to quite the same degree as in you know, canonical cases like linguistic communication. 
So again, to be precise, there can be graded variation in the extent to which audiences interpret behavior based on recognition of an informative intention. Now, those two continue quite, quite abstract definitions. They're pretty specific language. So me and my co-author, Christoph Heinz, have debated and fought over at some length. Um, to make them a bit more concrete, I'm going to um, give, give, give an example very shortly. So there's the two axes, and we can put them on um, at right angles to one another. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that the, there's a whole rich space here to, to talk about. So prototypical instances of human communication uh, are those in the top right. We make our informative intentions manifest and audiences recognize that and that recognition contributes to interpretation. That's the classic Gricean case. I think it has its most cognitively plausible description in what's called relevance theory. It was developed by Dan Sperber and Deirdre Wilson. Um, uh, but you know, um, many, many people have studied communication in a great deal of detail. Okay, sometimes we just observe others. We just watch them doing what they do. Uh, they are attempting to inform us. Um, as such, they don't have an informative intention, so our interpretation of their behavior cannot be based on any recognition of any informative intention. So that's down in the bottom left. Now, in theory, hidden authorship belongs also in the bottom left. Successful hidden authorship belongs in the bottom left. My goal as the communicator or the informer is not to make my informative intention manifest. And therefore, if I do that successfully, that cannot contribute to interpretation. So that's down there. Cases of failed hidden, hidden authorship, though, are quite different. Here, I've attempted to keep my informative intention, you know, not uh, to, to uh, excuse me, I've tried not to make it manifest, but I failed. It's a, it's a little bit, man. It's, it's, not, it's not a zero, it's somewhere along here. But now as an audience, you spotted that, oh, you were trying not to show me that you had an informative intention. You were just trying to, you know, manipulate me. And that recognition now may very strongly contribute to your interpretation of my behavior. It's not simply that I spotted that you were, you know, putting a wine glass in the middle of the table and attempting to inform me that, you know, you, you've finished your glass of wine. You were trying to hide that fact from me. And so that way you well contribute to your interpretation of my behavior. So we're up up here somewhere. Okay, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to play a very short video of um, this couple teaching dance. It's just one minute long. Um, and my reason to do so is that although it's quite an ordinary case of, you know, human communication and you know, it's human teaching online, um, quite a lot goes on that actually moves around that space. Uh, they do it quite dynamically and all, you know, without, you know, when I, I feel that when I watch videos like this with that space in mind, I see them moving around doing, they do this, they do a bit of that, they do a bit of this, a bit of that. I'll play the video and then I'll talk a bit more about the different things that they do in this video that entail making more informative intentions more or less manifest. I'm going to show you from all the angles, kick, kick, what that footwork looks like when we're offset. Kick, kick. The first kick for me, leaders, with my left foot is to the outside of my partner. And the second kick step with my right foot is in between the legs. Kick. We're gonna rotate this around. Kick, kick, and rock, step, kick, kick, and then <laughs> you can see for Evita, her first kick step after the rock step is between my legs. And the second kick is to the outside. Kick, kick, rock, step, kick, kick, and good. Yeah. You'll also notice that when we take the rock step, our bodies do kind of go away from each other, and then we stand a bit more upright for the kicks. Okay, so it's a super simple, you know, um, example. It's just fifty seconds of teaching, but uh, as I say, I think it, you know, they, they do quite a lot of interesting things here. Um, ethnographies of teaching, uh, you know. They report enormous array of diversity. Those of us who are raised in weird environments tend to think of teaching as quite a formalized and structured uh, phenomenon, but it's, a, it's enormously diverse, in fact. Um, so, yes, there is most obviously verbal instructions and other prototypical forms. You see that in the ethnography, you see that in this video. That's very obvious. Um, but there are some other things they do as well. And here's one of them, um, which you may not have spotted if you're not a dancer at the right level of experience for this particular video. So they do that rock step, kick, kick many, many times, as you will have seen. Um, but just one of, I don't know, there's 10 or 12 of them in the video. 
just one of them. They actually exaggerate quite some, quite somewhat um, the movement away from one another, uh, particularly in the hips. And they do that precisely at the moment when their bodies are rotated to the right angle to, to the camera. And, and so they're, they're rotating and they're rotating. And then when they're at that particular angle, there's one particular rock step, kick, kick, where they really come apart. And they don't say it. They don't say anything about this. They just do it. And they do it enough such that the target audience, which is to say the learner at this level of experience, will spot that exaggeration. And they will, ah, oh, okay, that's something I need to pay attention to. Now, Evita then um, actually, you know, she, 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 after the event, you know, tells us verbally, but she doesn't point out which particular kick she did this on and she exaggerates. She didn't do it, she did it more than she would normally do it in order to bring attention to it for the particular audience without bringing any. Uh, without saying so at the time they did it. Um, so just to, oh, bear with me. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna show the, um, it's I think the, the shortened version of the same video and you'll see which one of the um, Brock Step Kick Kicks is the exaggerated one. Now without the verbal instruction there, now, bam, much further apart, just for that one example compared to all the others and just, Oh, I thought I had. Oh, I don't. Oh, yeah, here we go. So let me go back to this slide. Yeah, that's most of the kicks at this, this distance apart. That's the exaggerated one. And if you're, if, you know, as a learner, you will see his arm is further apart. Her arm is at quite a different angle to here. The distance between them is much further. Not something you necessarily spot if you're not the target audience. Okay, so. They have some exaggerated demonstration. Now, where to place that in this uh, in this space that I've constructed? Well, they make their informative intentions somewhat manifest, but they don't, not to the same degree as when they're verbally talking about it or, or pointing at it, right? But it's there if, you know, it, their informative intention is somewhat manifest, as I say. Now, on the interpretation side, uh, how much, to, to what extent does the audience interpret their behavior having recognized that they are exaggerating? Well, that depends on the learner. You know, we vary on an individual by individual basis, but plausibly, you know, in some cases, oh, that's what I need to be paying attention to. It's up here. In other cases, oh, yeah, I knew that already, and it, it, that'll be down here. Right? And it can, it can vary on a case by case basis. Another thing they do very obviously is they just do repetition. And again, if you look at ethnographies of teaching, this is a very common thing. Um, teachers or masters, uh, you know, repeat their behavior to be taught uh, and learned over and over. They don't necessarily do anything special over and above that. Above that, They don't necessarily provide instruction. They don't necessarily provide exaggeration, um, but they do just repeat and repeat, uh, so, you know, uh, to facilitate observation by the learner. And so in this case, do they make their informative intention manifest? Well, the fact that they're repeating it makes it somewhat manifest that they have an informative intention. But above and beyond that, there's nothing. And to what extent does that contribute to interpretation? Well, that again, that varies on a learner by learner basis. But plausibly, um, you know, they recognize that this is being done for me and it can contribute to interpretation up here. Could also be down here. Okay, another thing you see in the ethnography of teaching is tolerated observation where the master does nothing except what they normally do, but they allow themselves to be watched. So this is something that's quite common in uh, apprenticeship situations. You know, the, the apprentice just often just watches the master go about their business. Uh, and that, that's often called tolerated observation in the, in the ethnography. Okay, so that's just, you know, that again, Go to the original literature, you'll find enormous, you know, masses of different varieties of different ways of teaching, learning, and information flow. Um, and there's just a few of them here, and you know, they're present in that video I just showed you. But you know, we, we could we could take any particular instance and you know debate for a long time where exactly to put it, given this particular learner, and so on and so forth. Uh, point being, there is this diversity, and by thinking about these two continua, we can start to make sense of. Um, sense of the diversity in a unified way, rather than treating each particular case just on its own isolated terms. The unifying hypothesis is this, that what communicators aim to do is to make their informative intentions manifest just to the extent that it's useful. So when they need to be overt, they need to talk, they need to point, they need to nod, do something very clear, then they will do so. But when they don't need to do so, 
they you know they, they will make them for you it's easier to you know to not do the extra work so they will make them informative intentions manifest just to some lesser degree um, i think that's a unifying hypothesis i think um a great deal of both the literature in experimental cognitive psychology and in uh, anthropology in anthropology is consistent with that um but it you know i think it would be fair comment to say that we don't have a paper uh, as yet you know it, surveying those literatures with this specific hypothesis in mind i think that would be a really interesting project to pursue in fact okay and it's worth pointing out that when we think about the evolution of communication and the study of communication the overwhelming majority of our research is just in one corner of this space uh, in fact the lit you know i did my phd in language evolution that's still my main community and um you know we talk about language evolution and we focus on what's here and if I have an evolutionary point to make, as I said earlier, the evolution is of the cognitive capacities that allow us to navigate this space. Language evolution is very special, it's obviously very important special case with its own distinctive features. Um, but it's a mistake to think, well, we have to explain the evolution of this. What we have to explain the evolution of is the cognitive capacities that enable all of this. Okay, that leads me on to um, the third thing I want to talk about which is art and the art world, which, you know, given what I've said so far, you won't be surprised that I'm going to suggest that art world is also exploiting the same cognitive processes uh, in all sorts of diverse ways, uh, not necessarily in the top corners, but in a large part of the middle of the space in different ways. Okay. Some of you will know this, so those of you who have been to the uh, Art Museum of Chicago certainly will know this because it's on display there. This is Night Hawks by Edward Hopper. Um, some other paintings of Hopper and all of this work. Um, it all has very plain titles. And you can see from the images, um, you know, they're very simple, simple scenes, uh, often isolated individuals. Even when it's got more than one individual, there is a sort of psychological sense of isolation associated with Hopper's work. Um, this is called uh, Drugstore in Maine, I think. Uh, yeah. And Hopper was, uh, you know, Hopper often declined to talk about, you know, what his paintings meant. But when he was pushed in an interview, he did say, look, if I could say in words, then I wouldn't, there'd be no reason to paint. Right? The whole point is I can't do it in that top corner of the space. I have to find some other way to, to express what it is that I want to express. And I find this uh, quote quite enlightening because it's um, it's the same idea or it's the opposite idea um, to a line from a famous linguist called Leonard Bloomfield, uh, first half of the 20th century. In the introduction to this book, he writes, language, after all, is a one way of communicating the kinds of things that do not lend themselves to drawing. Right? So it's the, it's the opposite idea, uh, or it's the same idea, as it were, but just expressed the other way around. And you can find similar ideas in other domains too, right? So Duke Ellington, what we could not say openly, we expressed in music. And what we know is jazz is something more than just dance music. Okay, so it's not, we're not just, not just creating something that's, sort of, you know, sonically nice. We're trying to express something about what it is to be black in America at a certain point in history. Okay, last example, um, uh, Isadora Duncan, famous uh, dancer, Soviet and uh, American dancer. If I could tell you what it meant, I wouldn't have had to dance it. Which I find that very, um, you know, it's really dramatizing the point. I can't do it with words, I can't do it with painting, I'm gonna dance. Okay. And I like these lines because, well, as you may be able to tell, they're, for me, they're pointing very much towards some sort of unity across very diverse domains of expression. These are all artistic domains of expression. Um, I think that, you know, the, the unity that underpins that goes even further than artistic domains. But I do think art falls within this general unity that I've been talking about so far. So how to make sense of all that, uh, you know, the, 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 art, the idea that artistic expression um, can do similar things to what we do in ordinary communication and the other examples I've talked about so far. Uh, and here I, you know, look to the big ideas in art theory and the, one of the big ideas most influential ideas of what called institutional theories of art associated most of all with um arthur danto and george dickey some some much quoted lines from the history of art theory 
To see something as art requires an atmosphere, artistic theory, the knowledge of the history of art, an art world. Um, and I, be I believe Danto capitalized in, in other work. Uh, and Dickey trying to offer a definition of art, a work of art is an artifact on which some person or persons acting on behalf of a certain social institution, the art world, has conferred the status of candidate for appreciation. So objects exist in the world all the time. You know, here, here is a pen, here is a pencil. But sometimes we put them on display. We give them some, you know, we're acting on part of the art world. We give them the status of candidate for appreciation. We put the plaque next to them on the wall. And we say, this is worth uh, some investment of your time to engage with. Okay. And that makes some sense. And it's quite an influential idea. Um, this is a relatively recent paper. I think voicing a common complaint. Okay, fine, fine, fine. But the claim that the art world confers the status of art onto objects remains utterly mysterious. So the challenge of this paper is quite a critical paper is to say, well, just fine, but how? How possibly could that work? Right? And um, the work I've done on, on art, oh, I haven't got the citation here, is essentially an attempt to answer that question um, by making the claim that the art that the art institutions exploit the same cognitive mechanisms that we use in ordinary communication. So here's a way to um, illustrate that point. This is uh, an art gallery in Japan. This is three, um, three of Claude Monet's famous water lilies paintings. And this room, um, to go into it, you have to take your shoes off and you have to put on slippers and the, the floor is soft and it is white. And these are the only paintings in the room and there's this nice lighting. So it's this strong sense of, okay, you know, this is worth your attention. Like give this some of your, your cognitive effort, right? It's quite unlike, you can see the same images, these same, you know, not the originals, but you can see copies of those images, just you can buy them for $20 on Amazon, right? You can just buy a duvet and it's basically the same image. Of course, it's not the original with all the paint and its texture. But this doesn't say, because it's not in the room with the plaque and the white walls and the nice lighting and the reverential atmosphere, it doesn't say this is worth your attention. In other words, it does not announce that there is any informative intention, there is any informative aspect. The duvet is just a duvet. But this image, the, the, this says, you know, this, this is the, the communicative aspect. This is the plaque on the wall, like the litter in the window earlier. This is saying, you know, Here's, there's something informative about this. Invest some time, invest some effort. You will get worthwhile cognitive effects back. This is a, this is a candidate for appreciation. Uh, so the, I don't think it's a coincidence that art galleries have these quasi-reverential um, vibes to them. They have white walls. They have a general you know, air of seriousness because they're trying, you know, the, their whole purpose is to announce to us this is, you know, this is something, you know, um, informative and uh, worth interpreting in such terms. So as I say, art draws, I think, on cognitive unity. And the skill of the artist, certainly the modern artist, is to create objects that actually reward that engagement. So having been given the status of candidate for appreciation, they've got to deliver something. You can't just put anything random on the floor because then people start to say, well, it doesn't do anything for me. Okay. So we're not claiming that art can be decoded in any traditional sense. It's not like language code model type uh, an approach. And we're nor are we equating given artworks with specific messages. On the contrary, in fact, as I'll elaborate in a moment. And um, nor are we claiming that viewing artwork is any sort of mirror of conversation. It's not all stuck in that top corner of the space. What we are saying is that the cognitive processes that are shared across many acts of interpretation. So across many, you know, interpreting different artworks, but also, um, you know, ordinary communication and, you know, interpreting teachers' movements and so on. So art interpretation is not a departure from utterance interpretation. It's just much, much, much more open-ended. To elaborate just a bit more on that open-endedness, it's worth making a distinction between comprehension and interpretation of what others do with, you know, when they, announce that they have informative intentions and they produce stimuli, whether it's words or points or movements of the body. Um, and we can comprehend or we can interpret. So in comprehension, it's more canonical. Meanings are strongly implicated and speaker has some responsibility for relevance and truth. And that's what's going on in linguistic communication, most obviously. In interpretation, the meanings, if they're implicated at all, they're only weakly implicated. 
And interpretations, you know, much more individual. It's much more open-ended. Here is something worth paying, you know, worth interpreting, but it's up to you what you to, um, what that interpretation is. It's less possible to be wrong, and you can't really hold the communicator or the artist responsible if you know if you rely on that for some, you know, something to do with truth, or truth or relevance. Um, it's not in this presentation, but I think it's worth saying in passing. A lot of what goes on with gurus, you know, um, psychological gurus, uh, you know, they're playing on, they look like this, but what they're really doing is something like this. Uh, and I mean, there is a skill actually in producing utterances that appear to be relevant and which demand that interpretation, but we're, you know, never quite possible to pin down exactly. Uh, a lot of that dynamic goes on in, with gurus. And there's a great paper by Dan Asperber called The Guru Effect uh, on that idea. Okay, so Deirdre Wilson, Dan Swerber's co-author, she's worked a fair bit on literature and interpreting literature from a cognitive point of view. She points out that literature is interesting because it involves both comprehension and interpretation. So we comprehend the words on the page. We read the words on the page, but what we interpret is the text as a whole. So you have this interesting situation where you, this feeds in to this. What's going on in painting and other forms of art is much more uh, exclusively on this side of it. Thing. Okay, going back to almost where we started, what's going on here? Well, this seems to me a case where, you know, <laughs> do what you like. Meanings are super weakly implicated. Arguably, they're not even there, right? So, you know, is this something about, you know, uh, uh, where are we? I've got, oh no, it's not there. Bear with me. Yeah, so. It's not clear if this is something about, you know, littering the world and, you know, how we're damaging our environment, or is it just something playful and intellectual? It doesn't matter. It's up to you. You can take it as, as you see fit. Okay. These ideas, I think, have um, points of connection. I'm going to try to tie things together here. These ideas about art have points of connection with uh, ideas both in the anthropology of art and in the um, philosophy of mind. So in the anthropology of art, uh, Ellen uh, Dissaniaki uh, wrote influentially, she, you know, she surveyed a lot of cultures uh, and what they treat as art. And her claim at the end of all that is that the biological core of art, the stain that is deeply dyed in the behavioral marrow, marrow of humans everywhere is making special. So we, uh, I read making special as making manifest and informative intention, putting something out there, you know, saying, well, yeah, I think I've said enough. I think you see, <laughs> I don't need to elaborate. I've said enough. Turning to the audience side, I see links with, as I said, the philosophy of mind, and this is going to be Jerry Foda. Um, he's talking about Danto here. He's commentating on Danto, but he, he riffs on Grice in doing so. Artworks are intending to affect audiences and do so partly in consequence of the audience's recognition of that intention. So he's drawing that link between, let's say, Grice and Danto. That's what's going on in interpretation. The art world essentially, you know, takes objects that might otherwise be here and pushes them along this axis. And by pushing them along this axis, it invites audiences to do so, to, to interpret them along, along this axis. And so you end up with art experiences that, you know, can be anywhere in the, in the larger space, but just not, not in the corners. Okay, so I've said a lot there and I've possibly gone a bit quicker than I intended, but maybe, maybe we're okay. Um, these are key papers that I have, um, that, you know, that I've summarized today and touch on the themes that I've uh, talked about today. The evolutionary dimension, as I said, I haven't elaborated about great tape, uh, social cognition and forms of attention manipulation, certainly can do so in the Q&A if you want. Um, but as I say, I think the evolution of this cognitive unity is connected to great tape social cognition. And that's a point um, that we elaborate in this new paper that uh, uh, you can see online already. Uh, it's, it's forthcoming. The bigger ideas are in this uh, BBS paper just here. Okay, here we go. Looking forward to the questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. I'll open with one very quick kind of um, clarifying question, or maybe not clarifying, but that uh, the video clip you showed of the dance where they, when they turn towards us and they exaggerate. The other thing, Evita, I think was her name. 
She also looks at the audience right before and has this exaggerated smile, almost telling you something is going to happen. Very good. I'm yes, thinking of that work of Zebra and Gergay on teaching where there's oh, yes, yes, certain yes, yes. cues that you provide before you're instructing somebody. I don't know if you thought about that. I don't, I don't know if I'd call I, I I've got some slight technical um, right. uh, reasons not to call it a cue, but uh, sure, whatever. Yeah. But, but what is the case? No. Is, I mean, you know, she might just be you know, smiling at the camera, but if you are the target audience, you'll pick up on as on what you've just picked up on. Hey, something's going on here, and you see that, yeah. and you see a face. Ah, it's, it's part right. of the same behavior. That exaggeration. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, okay. Questions. I have several, but I'll let Andre. Hi. Thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed how it brought in all kinds of aspects, including art and philosophy and so forth. Uh, I found uh, something kind of a coincidence and probably you know about this on your you as a demonstration of art draws on cognitive unity, you talked about the water lilies in Japan. Um, what's kind of ironic about this is that it also might show um, a kind of diversity within the unity because if you you probably know this in Paris in the orangerie, they the water lilies are also displayed and they've been displayed there since 1917. And um, and I, I just remember because I'd been there and I thought it was very impressive. And um, it's the same idea. That is, it's exactly the same idea. It's to show the impression of, to really focus on right. um, the, the water lilies. But what's really interesting is it's quite different, the display. There's no room with soft carpeting, nothing like this. You don't take your shoes off. You enter a room and it's a sort of center. And the water lilies aren't distinct from each other. They are all in a row. And the intent there is about cycles, um, maybe cycles that. So anyway, I'm using this as an example to suggest that there might be diversity that underlies the unity. And that diversity has to do with uh, cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the tropes that you suggested for the Japanese, you take your shoes off, you go to a plush place. There's kind of, there's very little lighting. There's very, it's completely different than the Parisian and the Orangerie, uh, that museum. Yeah, so, so it, it, I've, I've not been to that. I've not been there, but um, two uh, two points to add. Um, first, so the, the, you're definitely right that there's there's more than one way to make an informative intention somewhat manifest or sufficiently manifest. Right, one way is is the Japanese, or not even Japanese way. The way in that particular example I gave. Another is uh, is as you're doing, it. and uh, the second thing is um, uh, it's a question actually, a clarification question. They've been there a long time. You said 1917. So is that, is that part, right. yeah, is that part of, you know, is that fact made um, salient to visitors to the museum? Yes, it's quite right. explicit. Yeah. Right. There you go. So, you know, that appeal to history and longevity is it, I mean, the way I would read that is that's attempting to perform the same function as the, you know, the reverential room. In, you know, there are different ways of doing the same thing, which is to, very, you know, make well yeah. to be technical to raise expectations of relevance in the audience. Um, yeah, to, and therefore to invest. The Japanese one is it quieter? Is it or is there also a description? Oh, and then no, no, the, I mean, I didn't go into the detail, but the the particular um, Karthik has vanished, so somebody better ask a question. Um, I'm, I'm back. Oh, here he is. My computer froze and I checked with my colleague next door whether, did that, did I, all, did you guys freeze or was that just me? No, we didn't freeze, but the recording has stopped to think, or maybe it started again, I'm not sure. It started again, okay. A uh, so Kinder. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it's quite interesting. Um, I had a kind of clarificatory question. I just wanted to get clear on your claim regarding artwork. Uh, so in a kind of follow-up to what Andre had said, art can be display, uh, displayed or what we recognize as art can be found in places which are not uh, recognizably museums. 
like mm -hmm. sculptures found in temples or uh, mm -hmm. sculptures found in parks and stuff like that. So uh, that art world uh, engages the in intention of the artist uh, to display it as art. Uh, is, is that all your, because that would sound not very interesting. Like that's what you expect uh, museums, the, the task of the museums to be. But mm -hmm. are you saying that uh, it's something more about the art? Uh, so for example, Danto, because you put him in the institutional theory, he's usually identified with it, but he distanced himself quite a bit from it and said, it's not just the institution kind of putting that label and uh, to uh, claim something as a work of art, but it's the transfiguration of an, of a, of, of an object into an artistic object that the, that the artist does. There's something about the transfiguration process. Uh, so are you, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, why uh, is it just restricted to museums and those spaces where art is displayed and not something about what the artist does uh, that exploits the intentions and communicative aspect? Yeah, so I don't know if I'm gonna answer your question, but two things which may, may answer it. Um, the first is that, that I suppose the challenge for um, that later, Danto view that you sketched would be Marcel Duchamp's work. So Duchamp takes supposedly everyday objects, right? And then he puts them on display. Overtly, in his case, you know, to, to challenge what people thought was art, right? If I put it in an art gallery and it can be recognized as a can, you know, in Danto's terms, candidate for appreciation, Dickie's terms, candidate for appreciation, then, you know, then it works. And people, let people you know, project all sorts of bizarre interpretations onto Duchamp. You know, show, the very fact that they do that shows that just putting on display can be sufficient uh, if, if the object is, you know, allows interpretation once you invest the cognitive effort in doing so. Um, as for, I don't know if art is the right word, well, objects, art, call it art, uh, that is not necessarily an art institution, not necessarily a museum, might be sculpture on display in some other way. Um, I don't... I don't know if I have any particular strong claim to make there one way or another. So what I'm interested in doing in the bigger scheme of things is taking these big ideas from art theory and trying to make sense of them in cognitive and evolutionary terms. So I find the art, the institutional theory of art quite thought provoking in that respect. And I want to make sense of it now. I, yeah, I suppose if I, if I, if I thought about it a bit more, I will hopefully be able to say something informative or you know, thoughtful about uh, those other cases, but I don't right now. Maybe you can help me. Yeah, because maybe, because you are relying so much on the institutional view yeah. of artwork. So any objections that that theory uh, is open to would be, uh, I mean, your theory don't... would be subject to the same. For example, uh, in an art world or in a context like uh, a country which does not share the Western art world, yeah. Uh, an, uh, any artist going and putting up a urinal in a museum wouldn't count as a work of art because it's not in the line of the of history of art in that way. So it's not really a comment or any kind of rally against any idea that uh, preempted it. So then it would not constitute artwork. Other kinds of objections is um, a child doing something similar to say Jackson Pollock, creating just a, mm. uh, like yeah, spray yeah. paint on a canvas. Uh, but that wouldn't constitute a work of art, even if somebody accidentally put it in. Uh, yeah, so it's, I, I suppose I'm uh, I'm not necessarily attempting to defend the institutional theory of art, at least not with a capital D, not with a you know strong. But um, it, it obviously captures something that's interesting and important, uh, and I want to make sense of that something. Uh, you know, and as I say, connect it with the cognitive and evolutionary aspects. Um, I think, so, uh, you know, objections to that theory, fine, you know, uh, that, that's actually, you know, just makes the world a bit more interesting. Um, the one thing I suppose I would want to claim is that, you know, work that is, work that is or I, objects that are treated as, you know, art in some sense of, of that word, the one thing they will share in common is that they, you know, they're announced one way or another it's not not just a random object lying around they're given a present they you know they're presented in some way whether it's on a wall or in an art you know our institutions are sort of almost the uber version of presentation because they're institutional and, and so on and so forth it actually really you know churches too and all sorts of religious um buildings uh 
So the, yeah, the one thing that we'll have in, everything will have in common, I guess, is is this presentational form. But that pre, you know that presentation can be quite you know individual, or it can be massive and institutional. If I, if I could jump in there real quick, um, I really enjoyed your talk. I think you're exactly right. I don't think you need to hitch your argument to the institutional mm. way. The way you could read Dickey or Danto is also to say, if I now do this on the screen and thereby frame your attention, I've already created yes. an institutional yes. framework because by duty of my claim, and I thought when you showed that window littered with debris, you zoomed in on the little tag. That's the meta commentary, but you didn't have to do it. The fact that there was somebody signing off on it, yes, that was a Duchamp move, but the fact that you showed us that window with litter already produced the attention that you then call art or not art, and we can fight over it. So I think your argument is really, I think the institutional theory was one meant to combat you know, romantic idealist understandings of artworks where there is some kind of spirit uh, mm. or ethos or truth at work. And the institutional view was just a way to push back against that essentialist, idealist notion. I I'm not sure you have a dog uh, in the fight for this one. So I would just, uh, in the argument, just back, you know, use that. But I don't think it's necessarily about the institution. Yeah, I find I, I yeah, I think I'm my answer to the previous question was pointing at something similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I've got your hand up, Arthur, but you're the chair, so yeah, you know. so I can ask whatever I want. <laughs> um I, I, I really liked the that two-dimensional space that you had between production and interpretation. And I started thinking about the upper left corner, low on production and high on interpretation, in particular, Peter Sellers' movie being there. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, he he's, a, he's Chauncey the gardener, and he utters banalities, and everybody, including all of Washington, interpret him to be a guru. And I was wondering about the opposite of the guru effect something like a disciple effect where you have people looking for interpretation, even when they're not there. Ooh, that's um, nice. and, and what that might speak to a current climate of like conspiratorial thinking and others, uh, such phenomenon. That's There's not really a question there. There's the more of just a comment. Right. So you're suggesting that gurus. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, need, I I understand the idea. I need to think yeah. about that. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the first. I think thing you have a paper on the disciple effect and what it says about conspiracies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, well, the first thing that springs to mind is uh, Monty Python's The Life of Brian. Yeah. Where yeah. Brian is not attempting to be a guru, but everybody's right. looking. For uh, yeah, and being there is a very similar idea with Peter Sellers. Yeah. Andre. Uh, can I go back to the Nighthawk, um, the Hopper, just to think about this? It, um, so when I learned about Nighthawk, uh, I don't know where I learned about this. It it turns out this is this seems to matter to me a lot uh, when I look at it that uh, Nighthawk was painted uh, just after Pearl Harbor, mm. and I believe that some. I mean, I've been my last comments about 1970, that was all wrong. I I, I lo just looked it up. It turned out yeah, to be 28. Yes, not 1917. Yeah. It was 1918 when um, when uh, they were donated to, to the French government. Anyway, so I could be wrong. My point is, is I, I could be wrong about all this too. But I believe that uh, that is part of his intent, is that Hopper's intent was to depict the scene in the aftermath of dealing with uh, Pearl Harbor. Now, why, why does that matter? about the dancers it, it, that the teaching was the exaggeration maybe the uh, art critic is doing yeah. some of that oh okay so you don't mean in terms of the specific content that the art critic the context that the art critic provides historical or otherwise 
but you mean in terms of, I suppose, almost the existence of art, art criticism at all, or is that? I don't know. I was just intrigued by oh, this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, well, the existence of, of a great deal of art criticism, you know, does raise expectations of relevance further. You know, Hop Nighthawks comes with a lot of, you know, reputation. Um, and so people, uh, you know, invest just as they do with gurus because they think they're going to get something back if they invest effort in trying to interpret what's being said or what's, what's painted, then they'll do that. But I don't think um, that's not the dimension the, the, that's in those that's in that space that I, I sketched. My computer froze again, so I'm sorry if I missed something. Uh, anybody else with questions? We have more time. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Tom. I think I'm- My pleasure. All right.